thank you very much for, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So um, this is work that uh, I did uh, with two of, of my previous uh, PhD students, Arthur Bastel and Ricardo Rao. Um, and um, it's basically about how to define uh, free energy transaction in, in chemical reaction networks. So before moving to chemical reaction networks, I simply want to briefly remind you of uh, the, how uh, the thermodynamics of energy transduction uh, works. So energy is conserved, uh, but the fact that when converting one source of energy into another, irreversible processes happen because uh, entropy uh, is produced uh, during this conversion process. And the typical uh, picture one can have in mind is that one needs to take that energy from one type of reservoir and, and transfer it into all, as different forms of energy in other reservoirs. And there's an entropy production associated to this transfer. And this entropy production in a steady state, we can assume that the system itself uh, doesn't change. And so the, the relevant thing is the rate of entropy production in the reservoir. And for transduction, we will have that the entropy production contains two terms. Uh, one that is uh, the positive one that has the, the form of a flux times a thermodynamic force. This is very abstract. I will soon show you examples, but I, I think it's useful to, to show that it can be put in, in that very abstract form. So the, the, there's the process one that powers the transduction that has a flux one and a corresponding force one, which in absence of uh, process two would uh, would flow in, in its spontaneous direction. It could happen alone because the entropy production uh, is always positive. But there's a second process that is typically the one one is interested in that would not happen alone because in, in this case, the flux is going against the direction of its force. And therefore, it only can happen if the first process is sufficiently positive to enable the sum of the two to be positive. And as a result, the efficiency of that conversion uh, is defined as the ratio of the output uh, by the input. And by definition, or by consequence of the first law, um, is bounded uh, by one. So, uh, OK? So now to connect to things that uh, you probably wonder about, which is the, the, the most common uh, form of energy conversion, which is the thermal machine, where work is extracted from a heat bath and the remaining energy is dumped in a cold bath. In that case, entropy production is given in, in these two reservoirs by the heat divided by the temperature of the reservoir. But by using the first law, which tells us that energy is conserved and that heat from the hot reservoir plus heat from the cold reservoir plus work uh, has to be equal to zero, the rates, uh, we can rewrite, this is trivial algebra, we can rewrite the entropy production in this form where the famous Carnot efficiency has been introduced. That's a number bounded between uh, zero and one. And now by following the recipe that I was describing, the efficiency is defined as the thing that one wants to extract. So work extraction is making this work negative. And this is only possible because this term needs to be bigger than this one. And as a result, the efficiency defined like this is always bounded by one. And now, of course, you wonder why historically we say that it's bounded by the Carnot efficiency. This is simply a, a matter of uh, historical definition, because if one simply defines the efficiency as the ratio of work to the uh, heat from the hot reservoir, then the eta C uh, is multiplied. Instead of one, one gets eta C. So that's simply a, a definition, uh, a, con a consequence of the definition. But that's kind of to give you the, the general flavor. And, and this works for any type of energy conversion, you know. Uh, wind to electricity, thermoelectricity, and all of the different sources of, of energy conversion that we know. So now the question is, how does this work in the context uh, of chemical reaction networks? Um, 
And it's important to distinguish two class of chemical reaction networks. They are the linear ones, or at least uh, pseudo linear in the following sense that um, in a linear system, dynamically, every reaction is a, a first order reaction. So in, in the simplest case, it's really a, a unimolecular reaction. In the slightly, the pseudo comes from the fact that we could have something like A plus E that gives E A, but A is chemostat. So A is fixed. It's not a dynamical variable. We imagine that it is controlled from the outside. And this is how we actually open a chemical reaction network is by fixing the concentration of those uh, species here that are circled and that I will call the chemostated species. So if A is chemostated, you know, you can simply think of incorporating that concentration into the effective kinetic constant and you effectively get a unimolecular uh, reaction. Um, and these networks are very useful, but they are very limited also, but they, they've been extensively used to model enzymes, molecular motors, and the theory of energy transaction in this network has been developed in the 60s, 70s uh, by the pioneers like Hill and Schnackenberg, and, and extensively uh, since the late 90s uh, in stochastic thermodynamics, people have increasingly looked at the energetics of, of these kinds of systems. But nonlinear networks are very different because they have, they go beyond unimolecular reactions, so they have dynamical uh, uh, bimolecular uh, reactions that create dynamical nonlinearities. And the methods that are used to study linear network cannot be um, easily, ex not, a, not because they are based on graph uh, theoretical method, they cannot be extended to nonlinear uh, chemical reaction network. And nonlinear chemical reaction network are ubiquitous in, in biology. And, and most importantly, uh, uh, metabolism contains a lot of uh, uh, B molecular reactions. So the goal of this talk is to explain how to define energy transduction in these nonlinear chemical reaction networks. So the way in which we describe these networks is the following. We have first the energy of the species is given by the chemical potential. That's you can think of this simply as, as the energy of a, a species in solution. The solution can be non-ideal, but in, in, in the ideal case, this, this gamma term here would be one. So the energy is typically proportional to the logarithm of the concentration, and the standard potential is the, the energy inside the molecule itself. And this has to do with the, the, uh, the, the way in which the, the concentration mix uh, with each other. So the dynamics is a, a dynamical equation for the concentration. So the concentration of the species change according to the reactions that are inside the network. And uh, the, this is the, I think all of you know that, so I think I don't need to go too much into the detail. This is the stoichiometric matrix telling us with what stoichiometry each reaction contributes to the change of the species in the system. But because the system is open, we also have these fluxes coming from the outside because, for instance, we fix the concentration of these uh, chemostatic species. And so as a result, what is uh, consumed by the reaction needs to be compensated by external fluxes. Um, so uh, I think this, I don't really need to go into the, the detail because I think all of you are familiar with how these stoichiometric matrix uh, are constructed. So the important thing is that it's a purely topological object. Um, now, how do we define entropy production in a chemical reaction network? At steady state, I will, everything I will say will, will be limited to steady state, although extension can be considered. Um, at, um, Actually, the first equality is, is true in general. Um, it's the second one that is restricted to steady state. So the entropy production uh, is given by the change in energy caused by all the reactions. So this is really the current through every reaction multiplying these delta Gs. The delta Gs are the changes in the chemical potential of the species between reactant and products. Uh, so it's kind of natural. And Importantly, for elementary reaction, 
the product of the current through a reaction multiplied by the delta G of the reaction is always positive. So this causes the first kind of puzzle. Ah, uh, transduction cannot happen at the level of single reactions. There's no way to make a current uh, of a reaction flow in the direction opposite uh, to its uh, force. So it's going to be an emergent phenomenon when many reactions are coupled to, the, to each other that appears at the level of the network. Um, and this delta G, I emphasize, depend on, are the, depend on the difference of chemical potential of all the species in the system. But there's a technique that I will briefly describe in the next slide, which is based on only uh, the knowledge of the stoichiometric matrix and on which species are chemostated to rewrite at steady state the entropy production in terms of a much smaller set of currents. The, the, these currents are currents along what we call emergent cycles. And these, uh, the forces uh, corresponding to those currents are only expressed in terms of combination of the chemical potentials of the chemostat. So now we've kind of eliminated the dependence of the internal the, the energetics of the internal species disappears. We've expressed everything in terms of what's happening into the bath. Um, and at this level, we don't have any more that restriction. So currents can start flowing against their forces. And let me first give you the physical interpretation of this emergent cycle, and then we will uh, go in slightly more, uh, slightly more in, into technical details. The emergent cycle, you can think of them as sequence of reactions that do not change uh, upon completion the internal species of the network, but that do transfer uh, chemostat uh, species from one chemostat to another. So if we take, for instance, this simple uh, network here, which is actually linear simply for sake of illustration, these are the, the, the four chemostated species. There are two emergent cycles in this uh, system, and they are as follows. So you see that if you perform this reaction, this reaction, and this reaction, the net effect is that you haven't changed the internal species, but you've transported one A into a D. And the second emergent cycle is very similar. OK, so now I, I told you that we can conceive transition uh, transduction at the, the level of this emergent cycle. Slightly more in detail, how do these uh, how do we get this emergent cycle? Well, if we are at steady state, the X now are the internal species, Y are the chemostated species. That's why the, the current from the external, um, from the outside, only appears in the chemostated species, whose concentration is by definition fixed. For the internal species, I put X dot to zero because I require the steady state condition. And so I know that my steady state currents can will be uh, in the kernel of the, the, the X part of the stoichiometric matrix. So this is uh, going back to the example I had before, the, stoichiometric, the full stoichiometric matrix, this one, as X is the part that acts only on the internal species. Uh, and I can decompose the steady state current uh, in terms of uh, vector spanning that kernel and differentiate those uh, that are also in the kernel of the full S matrix from those which are only, uh, that are not in the kernel of the full S matrix and, and therefore only in the kernel of S X. These, uh, these ones are the internal uh, cycle. So they change, uh, they leave the, the concentration also of the internal species uh, unchanged when the system is uh, closed. So namely, when we look at X and Y together, while the emergent cycles are, as I said before, those that um, do not change the internal species, but do change the uh, chemostated species. And so uh, if we act with the stoichiometric matrix on an emergent cycle, you see that we get something finite for the Y part uh, of the species. This is the example. The, the, in, for this network, we have one internal uh, cycle. If we perform one, 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 it means every reaction. We see that if the network would be closed, we haven't done anything. We, we, we went back to the initial point. But um, this emergent cycle here, 
um, is, is uh, when the system is open has the effect of transferring an A species into a B species. And that's why we can express now this entropy production at steady state in terms of only the chemical potential of the chemostat because the, the, what, the part of the internal species drops out because the internal species are not changed along the uh, emergent cycles. Okay, so we can now define, um, we, we go back to the, the, the key point, which is this decomposition of the dissipation in terms of uh, currents along emergent cycle multiplied by the force along that emergent cycle. And this decomposition will now allow us to discriminate the processes that contribute uh, as an output, the negative one in the dissipation, from the one that are positive and that play the role of the powering uh, process. And the efficiency will be defined as minus the output divided by the input and bounded by one. In the simple case that we that uh, we looked at before, the linear network, we had two emergent cycle, and for instance, we can identify the process uh, associated to the first emergent cycle, which is the conversion of A into D, the second one B into C, since the entropy production is now the sum of the current along the first emergent cycle times the force of the first emergent cycle, and same for the second one, uh, if um, uh, the, um, this uh, term uh, is positive, the, that's the reaction that will not happen spontaneously. It can happen thanks to this one, and so the efficiency will be this uh, ratio between the negative contribution and the positive one. So that's the general recipe. But I looked until now only at very simple network, and what I presented, all the, the concrete network I looked at were quite simple and could have been studied within the framework developed by Hill and Schnackenberg. But now I want to argue and show you how our uh, framework becomes really essential to look at more complicated networks that, are, that contain uh, nonlinearities, uh, such as uh, cellular respiration. So this, this uh, clearly has some uh, nonlinear uh, reactions. And you probably know that cellular respiration uh, is the chemistry that allows us to extract energy from glucose and, and uh, produce the ATP, which is the, the molecule that is used to perform all the important tasks uh, in our cells. So um, if one looks at, one puts all the reactions of cellular respirations um, and one chemostats uh, glucose, oxygen, ADP, phosphate, uh, protons, which is the pH, CO2, H2O, and ATP. So the idea is that we treat this as the environment. And we do the analysis that I explained you to find these emergent cycles based on the stoichiometric matrix and on the chemostatic species. One finds a single emergent cycle. That's quite uh, amazing that all these complex network produces a single emergent cycle. And the, the, the stoichiometry or in the, the, yeah, the, the stoichiometry with which each reaction needs to happen uh, along that cycle is, is really uh, encoded in this drawing. You see when twice the reaction needs to happen or when 10 times this reaction, 22 times this one. So this is a pictorial way to represent the emergent cycle of cellular respiration. We can identify the two relevant process along this single cycle. The first one is the burning of glucose, literally burning glucose, because if you burn actually glucose, that's exactly the reaction that you would get. Uh, and that uh, reaction uh, uh, liberates uh, about 3000 kilojoule per mole. And the emergent cycle is such that for each of these, that, that uh, each glucose molecule burned, uh, 26, uh, this is for E. coli, it, it, there are small variation across uh, species, but we, we will consider E. coli. Uh, we have 26 ATP um, that are uh, synthesized at the cost of uh, 45 kilojoule per mole each. And therefore, the, uh, the dissipation, the entropy production, is now we have a single emergent cycle. So it's the current along that emergent cycle times the force along that emergent cycle. But 
this discriminating between process alpha and beta, uh, we have the, the two delta G appearing. And you see that now when we define the efficiency, a special feature of systems which have a single emergent cycle is that the flux in the numerator and denominator is the same. And so the efficiency between becomes independent from the current. And so we can basically look at the um, physiological concentrations uh, of these chemostated species. Uh, this we looked at in equilibrator and we can calculate um, the value that give us an efficiency of uh, 40%, about 40%. The theoretical maximum would be uh, one and would correspond to generating 60 ATP per molecule of glucose. But remarkably, our cells uh, using all these reactions found a way to reach uh, 41% uh, of that efficiency. Now, um, I just want to uh, consider a less, uh, a more complicated example, which is not tightly coupled. So that has more than one emergent cycle for that. I will focus on uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. First glycolysis, um, so that's the first part of, of, of the uh, entire cellular respiration. Uh, it, also, it produces already ATP, but by converting glucose into pyruvate and NAD plus into NADH. So that's the single emergent cycle uh, of glycolysis. And uh, here we can also define the two processes, uh, the glucose and NAD plus converted into two pyruvate and two NADH, and the one that won the output, which is the synthesis of ATP. And uh, it's tightly coupled, so that worked exactly as before. And look at the ratio, glycolysis itself produces ATP with 53% uh, efficiency. But I, I, I showed you this because glycolysis is um, coexisting with gluconeogenesis in, in cells. There are regulation mechanisms that prevent the two from happening together. But uh, from a purely uh, stoichiometric point of view, if we analyze, if we add the reactions of uh, gluconeogenesis and we do the analysis uh, to find the emergent cycles, we find three emergent cycles. The one uh, of glycolysis, the one of gluconeogenesis, and a futile uh, cycle. So you see that the, the two here are almost the same. Most of the reaction at the beginning are the same, um, except uh, some reaction and the enzymes uh, are different. But as a result, now we have three emergent cycles. Um, and so the entropy production reads as the sum of these three emergent cycles. Um, and so we lost tight coupling. And if we are interested now in the efficiency with which ATP is being synthesized in a system where all these reactions uh, are present, one would need to isolate all those <clears throat> that produce ATP, because you see, for instance, the futile cycle is actually uh, removing ATP. It's hydrolyzing ATP into ADP. Uh, gluconeogenesis is running in the opposite direction uh, of glycolysis. So it is actually also using ATP instead of producing them. That's why these two fluxes now appear with a minus sign. And the output um, is, is the product of glycolysis minus gluconeogenesis minus the futile cycles multiplied by the change uh, in free energy of the ATP hydrolysis divided by the rest, all the other terms in the entropy production. But now I cannot give you a number because if I want to give you this efficiency, I would need to model the kinetics and know the specific values of the currents. I can tell you that <coughs> typically uh, tightly coupled systems, so system with a single emergent cycle are the most efficient. This can be proven in the linear regime. I don't know, there's no general proof of that, but. Uh, it's kind of a, it, it's um, in all the cases that I have ever encountered, it's always the case. So I, I, this is still a, an open question to prove that, but I'm pretty confident that it is true. And so uh, what I suspect, and, and this is known in the case of glucose, uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, 
is that what makes this um, um, a cell efficient is that when the cell performs glycolysis, there are regulation mechanism kinetically shutting down the uh, flux across uh, gluconeogenesis so that de facto, I think the system can work close to a single emergent cycle. But these are, this is the topic of our future work to start to look into the regulation of these uh, different pathway uh, via kinetic mechanisms. So uh, with that, I conclude. Uh, I, I hope I could show you that the framework that we have allows us to look at uh, and uh, to define in a, in a meaningful way energy transaction in complex uh, chemical reaction networks. And uh, the future challenge is to start looking at regulation. And I simply take the opportunity to advertise postdoc position uh, in that field that are available in the group. If you have people interested, uh, please let them know. Thank you very much. <laughs>